on hybrid learning, I will try to uh, keep myself silent and let you have the floor. So, welcome, Chris. Okay. Number three is back. Go for it. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody for participating in the uh, daily create for FSL 213. I, I don't know if you're familiar. There's a daily create. I've got the uh, URL down at the bottom of the slide for uh, DS 106, the digital storytelling MOOC. Not a MOOC. Jim Groom calls it a community of practice of learners there. But uh, you know, I want some of these, um, just especially the one with the button and the mousy hand there. <laughs> these are cool, really cool. I've enjoyed the creative collages that, that we've done at these sessions. And I really, really look forward to this session, too. Um, it is sort of, as George said, it's a culmination of my micro teaching session from um, First Steps 12. Well, let me begin, because I always have to have a theme. When I write my book, <laughs> the many books I have in my mind, uh, I always have to have a title first. So you guys like that? You know, you title it first, and, and then comes the content. But um, so um, I wanted to go with a gardening theme. And you can see, because I'm a gardener, I bet there are other gardeners out there. Um, but you can see I drew, it's sort of, well, it's a flower. You can tell that, a sunflower. And um, to me, it represents um, openness and reaching toward the sky, and also that I grow toward my students' light. At least I'd like to think that, and never stand in their light. Okay. Anybody else want to mention anything about they, what they've drawn? Uh, hopefully, everybody's had a chance to look over it. Okay. Cool. We'll have a lot more chances to draw to contribute to these created collages. So, my. Theme, how does your garden grow? Uh, so you can be, I like to think of myself as uh, I've heard Howard Rheingold describe offline gardening and online gardening. So I'm using a gardening theme today. And um, I, uh, I have a link with all, and you know, you know I love Digo, and so I have a link with um, all of the resources that I know I'll mention. And I have a loyal friend, my loyal uh, link dropper, Bill, courageous too, trying to keep up with me. Who will be dropping some links into um, into the back uh, channel there, and you know, like I said, this is a combination like a year, and I've been thinking about this and planning and and really enjoying First Steps 13, and um, and then like within 24 hours, though, I was like, whoops, no, I got, I'm going to change directions and go another way. So this is what I've ended up with, and I do want um, this to be. Have you ever heard uh, the research? I need to look this up. That when a lecturer sounds conversational, ask questions, even if they're truly, if it's truly not a conversation, they get higher ratings than, than if not conversational. Just that ability, the effort to reach out. Well, I want this to be a real conversation. So, um, so please do join in and, and add to contribute. And take us another direction if you'd like, OK, as we go along. What I thought I would um, focus on is questions. Um, what is hybrid learning? What is the hybrid learning? I actually had not heard of, I heard of hybrid courses and blended, but hadn't actually heard the term hybrid learning until First Steps 13. Um, so I've been thinking, what is it? What is the hybrid learning and open academic practice connection? And then what might course design for open academic practice look like? And I hope that um, this session builds on those Jennies and Sylvias that have come before in terms of openness and in terms of creating an open community. Um, gardening theme here, you see I have everything. It's sort of a continuum from the walled garden, which I'd love to go to this walled garden at a country house in Suffolk. Uh, I think it's called Ickworth someday. Maybe perhaps some of you have been there. And um, so from the walled garden that I've heard a learning management or virtual learning environment called, um, to guerrilla gardening, which is the latest in this idea, rather unauthorized planting of fruits and veggies and flowers anywhere, both to make uh, vacant lots and the roadway medians attractive, but also to raise food and to, for the good of the planet, the stewardship of the planet. And it is a great TED Talk, thank you, Bill, by Ron Finley. I definitely would encourage you to watch that. 
So Jenny got us started, and my favorite definition of the many definitions that she offered for openness is it's a way of being. I was so inspired. I've been reading uh, Carl Rogers on becoming a person uh, this summer, inspired by this definition of openness. And so I went back to the slide, our creative collage from Jenny's session. And um, I thought it would be interesting to see after four and a half weeks if you felt that your openness had changed in any way. So I invite you right now to, um, you can write your name, type your name, you can draw, whatever you would like, in some way make your mark on this matrix. And um, if, you are, if you feel that you've moved, draw a circle around your name or just write more. Just whatever, some way that we can see some results. And if you haven't, that's cool too, because you may have already been at that you know, farther end. Or um, if you feel more closed, you could do that too. <laughs> Just let us know. I'm going to, uh, I think I'm actually more so. so I've, I've, I'm trying to be more open in, uh, in my blogs too. I'm talking about uh, evaluating my classes. Cool. Thank you. So we see, I like the arrow. That was a good way to do it. Yeah, that's very clear. And the finger and the thumb that way too. Very good. Again, I love these collages. Got checks. I'll give you one more minute. Um, Jenny will be pleased to see this. Okay, I'm going to move along now. Uh, I can come back to this later too if you haven't had a chance to add to. So in one of the tutor um, sessions, tutor and expert participants, there was some discussion about how the open academic practice element that's so strong in first steps, um, how it connects, how it fits into the overall picture. And so I said I'd have a go at creating a graphic. And so Marion, um, this is enjoy this is what I came up with, and it's it's um it's very simple. But I just want to get you know a metaphor here, going with the theme. Um, I added the curriculum, the stages, um, and then the reflective practice throughout, and always moving upward, and then added the open academic practice that George shared with us, elements um, during our very first session. And I thought about open academic practice isn't the goal, the purpose, but it is in first steps considered to be a key element um, of best practices in teaching in higher ed. And I, and I came up with this idea um, that uh, in reading both, well, both inspired by Sylvia's session when she used the term community stewards, and in the Barber article about an avalanche is coming to higher ed. And so I would say the goal is well-educated global stewards. Okay. Any comments, any questions about, um, about this sort of how things fit together? I just have to okay. just ever so briefly to say what a lovely synthesis of the, of the course. Thank you. Um, I've got to take it away, though. I think that's, that's, that's a, a, nice, a nice objective. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Again, I, I love Sylvia's term with the stewards. Well, now what I'd like to do is to link from the um, open um, definition and our exploration of openness uh, and think about hybrid learning. So what is hybrid learning? It's, this is going to be interesting to see what you say. I don't think we actually had a conversation about hybrid learning. So if you would make a contribution to hybrid learning is, from your perspective, what is this thing, hybrid learning, that everybody's talking about these days? I'll offer my two cents worth. Yeah. 
it's a funny word, it is that. You know, hybrid has so many interesting conversations, uh, connotations. Crops, maybe not so good, you know, and cars, good. Yes, lots of interpretations. Learning from several different kinds of sources. It's formal, it's informal, different approaches. Gaming is also in, yeah. Context or hybrid too. Hmm. That's interesting. And it's online and face to face or on the ground, online, on the ground, on campus. The use of traditional and online methods for teaching. Maybe. Well, yeah, maybe because um, it probably has as many definitions as it has um, definers. Um, one that I've been um, sort of drawn to is Tony Bates um, has a really interesting um, take on it. He says that it is the best, the best of learning in both face-to-face -face and online. So it's the, the best kind of learning coming together. Um, and so catching up here, reading a few more of these, blended, informal, reflective, as well as directed. It is a, hol a holistic term that's nice. So you guys have been thinking about this a lot. And you know, some terms that, that I thought, if, if I were going to add single words, would be, it is open. Tony Bates um, quotes um, Dave Wiley. No, Dave Wiley and um, Cable Green talk about open teaching in an article for Educause. And they talk about an open teacher. It is both someone who opens their course up to the world, but someone, it has a connotation that is open to students, is more of the advisor, OK, uh, than the traditional role of teacher. And I have shared a really um, interesting video last night from Diana Lariard talking about she saw her role as um, eliciting high levels of thinking uh, from students and encouraging their learning. Um, and so I think it's both a, a learning with and a being open, being advisor. Um, I think that uh, hybrid learning is certainly social um, and collaborative, that it's distributive, that much of the learning um, actually emerges um, and it grows out of those people involved. Uh, of those learners. Um, I think it can be autonomous and self-directed and self-determined, not always self-determined in courses. Um, I really do um, like to think of the opportunities in hybrid learning for um, emergent learning because I think that um, within emergent learning there are great opportunities for creativity. Jonah Lerner, who's written a book called Imagine on Creativity, says it, there are rich dividends for creativity in emergent learning. And I think hybrid learning encourages that. I think it's participatory. Um, and participatory is a term that Howard Gardner, Howard, Gard Howard Rheingold, I knew I'd do that, uses a lot. And he says it's participatory and the real magic in participating using social media is that it's not the teaching as not, it's not a, I hate the delivery system model, um, the term of online teaching as a delivery system, but the ability to inquire together, seek understanding, build knowledge, and personally reflect. Um, as someone had written on the board there, reflection is a big part of all learning, especially I think hybrid learning gives you opportunities um, to reflect even more and to reflect with others. Okay. So participatory learning, a participatory culture. Um, I um, really like the work of Henry Jenkins. And he says it's less about the technology and more about helping our students develop those skills so they can be successful in a participatory culture. And he defines participatory culture as 
both where members believe that their contributions matter, they're low barriers to creative uh, expression and civic engagement, uh, there's strong support for creating and sharing one's creations. Um, there's some type of informal mentorship where those who have experience um, share with those who don't. Um, and members feel some some degree of social connectedness, and they can contribute and share if they'd like, um, but they don't have to, but they need to feel that they can and that what they contribute will be appropriately um, accepted. So participatory culture, I think, is, is something that I want, I mean, this is how I want to teach. Uh, this is friendly, uh, Roger said friendly staff, this is friendly teaching, I think, and, uh, and encouraging. It's not only the what of the course, but it's the how and how people can learn together. And um, I would offer that one of the most famous and most successful hybrid learners going today is um, uh, International Space Station Commander Chris Hadfield. Have you guys been following him? He uh, is such a, hats off you know, Canadians there, he is such a wonderful representative for NASA and for exploration. Oh, well this is a picture of him, George, where he's actually played, he's quite a musician, and he covered uh, David Bowie's Space Oddity. And it's, um, there's a link um, there that you can find um, that uh, it's, uh, there's a link both to his um, really great press conference where he debriefed about the mission and talked about using social media. And one of the things I really liked he said was that he was advising those who would like to um, become astronauts, even if they were in a country, as he was at age nine when Armstrong walked on the moon, where there were no astronauts and there wasn't a space program in Canada. But he said, make yourself physically healthy, have an advanced education, and he defined that as a proven ability to learn things. So I think, that's why I think he's a hybrid learner. He learned to use social media to reach out to people, to contribute, to share, and to create and inspire um, this interest, um, maybe um, re-inspire um, optimism and hope in um, the space program, and the future for that matter. Um, so I think hybrid learning, we're seeing more and more uh, examples of that, how people are using both the face-to-face -face and the online. Um, Sherry Turkle talked about, um, oh, this was like back in 1998, she and Donald uh, Shun, she actually edited a book on using technology to help out um, low economy communities. And um, one of the things that she said, and it struck me, I remember underlying even then was the virtual should act, should the virtual should enhance the actual. But these days, they've merged, haven't they? Very interesting um, developments. Now, going with my gardening theme, I've always gardened as sort of the lone gardener and thoroughly enjoyed it. Grew up on a farm, loved to dig in the dirt. But I've recently gotten into participatory gardening. This is my community garden. and. It uh, brings so much satisfaction to uh, be able to garden with others. And uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, hybrid learning going on here for me, and, and I bring that to my, uh, to my teaching, too. What I've done is taken here that same framework, stepping stone kind of um, stair step model, metaphor, and I've added how um, I would propose that we think about creating the opportunities for openness and for encouraging hybrid learning in our classes. And um, what I'm using is Claire Majors, she's at the University of Alabama, uh, and she's got a book in, in, um, right now being, being published, and she looks at five different areas and I'm seeing these as opportunities, areas for opportunity for openness. And you see access, amount, timing, learning environment, and network. 
And what I would like to do is invite you as we go through to sort of place your mark on the continuum, because you're seeing each one of these as a continuum. Place your mark on the continuum, and uh, you'll sort of come up with a profile. And we'll see a profile of what our class looks like. So think about a class that you teach or will teach or you're teaching in general, and mark on the continuum where do you think um, it fits in terms of access? Is it completely closed to the public, you know, university registered students only, or is it open to the world? Okay, I got some, and I know there are many people working on MOOCs, so I'm expecting to see a lot of opens here. Let's see. Got a lot of clothes too. And again, the beauty of the continuum, there is no right or wrong. It depends, um, it depends on what your class is and your student, who your students are. Okay. And we've got, you know, right, right in the middle there. So that's, a, that's an interesting opportunity too. <laughs> Oh, they all went away. I could repeat the question, Sylvia. It's simply um, to think about classes you teach or classes you've taken, what, whichever, or would hope to teach, and to mark in terms of how closed or how open. Is it closed and only university registered students, or is it open to the world? So it's sort of a continuum there. Watching interesting things happen to the whiteboard here. So it looks like we maybe have more clothes, but again, I know there's a lot of MOOCs that when you guys, uh, oh, there, there they come. There's the MOOCers right there. Um, when you uh, signed into the arrivals uh, lounge, I remember reading about a lot of MOOCs. Um, and, and some interesting names, too. What's the Eileen with uh, Smooch and Oops? Uh, love the names coming down there. Well, let me move on then and um, tell you that my courses are completely open, so at the far end of the continuum. And I actually went to the dean and explained, and this was several years ago, this, once I took um, uh, Plink 2010, the course still learning networks and knowledge, I got so excited that um, I decided to open up my courses. And uh, teaching literature for young adult was the first. And so here you see that there was tweeting about it. Um, and it was a type of professional development. As Mike here says, um, DS 106, Digital Storytelling 106, is completely open. And um, it's a great model for professional development that teachers can follow along at, like in young adult literature, we talk about the, late, the latest books. And so it's a good way um, to keep up with what's happening in young adult literature. There's also one aspect of opening up things that has made the biggest difference in my teaching, and that's guest speakers. I uh, am able, because I have it open, and we use um, Second Life. Uh, you'll see a picture there of my latest guest speaker, Mark Aronson, who wrote the text that I've used for like 10 years um, on young adult literature. But he came to speak with us. We're always having authors speak. Um, and, um, but the beauty, the, really the great thing, I often have my teen book club um, speak to our class, we have members who can join us, or they actually, they're a prince club, which means the princes like Caldecott and Newberry, it's the highest award, it's for young adult literature, American Library Association. Every year they read over 450 books, and they recommend their top 10. My class reads the top 10, because we don't have time to read a lot more, and then we get together in an event and stream it live to the world um, as a form of professional development for other teams, for authors, who, YI authors, who'd like to watch and get some of the insights from students on what they're liking about books or not liking. Um, so we call it, it's a big Oscars production theme, and we have uh, the Melinda Awards. So that's a lot of fun. And, and again, one of the real values of opening this for me is to be able to open up my class to the world and involve teens and involve teachers. Do, uh, one of my, uh, the rationale for the dean was it would help to bring diversity to my class, added a lot more librarians. Now, I'm not saying a lot more. I feel sort of like Lisa M. Lane, who had a great blog years ago about opening up her history course 
and nobody came. And uh, I have had people come. I have had people join us live. That's usually what they like to do. And, and I don't know about lurkers. So, but to make it open um, gives more opportunities, I think, for, for hybrid learning, too, for my students. Uh, so it's an exciting development. Any questions about um, the value of, of being uh, open teaching? Again, I think she does. She's got a great site. Uh, Lisa has a real passion. Uh, uh, Healy wrote last night about having a passion for online teaching, and Lisa has such a passion for online teaching. Well, let's move then um, to the next um, point or in the continuum here. Uh, the next element or classification, and that's amount. So there are opportunities in terms of do you have zero amount of online time in your course? Because I know many of you will be teaching traditional face-to-face, -face, although it's hard to find a course that's not web enhanced to some degree today. Uh, or do you have 100% online? Mine are 100% online, except for when we do meet for our Melinda Awards. Let's see. Got some interesting variations thereof. Tony Bates in his latest article about open um, about hybrid learning had said that um, uh, there's there's lots of models, but nobody's really come up with what works best where. So that's like the next great frontier. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for putting your mark there. Again, it's, it's all across the board there. So many different models, and I'm so pleased to see that because for so long it was the idea that uh, an open course is asynchronous and it's you know it's closed and uh, and that's it. Um, but there's so many variations thereof. I find as long as I have in the catalog and in the syllabus, this course is um, uh, it's open, but it also has. Um, it's totally online, but there's also a synchronous component and have the that day of the week included that things work out fine for students. And many of them really appreciate that um, connection, the F opportunity to build community. So with the openness um, and the amount of time there online, next would be Synchronous, asynchronous. Like I said, we've moved from the idea that it has to be uh, asynchronous, and there's more synchronous. Uh, like my classes meet each week. So let's see if, uh, please place your mark. We'll see a class profile develop here. So a lot more synchronous, yeah. Heard a model the other day. In fact, Claire Majors was—I think I got this right—was saying that they meet on, they have online, and then four times a semester meet face to face for like a Friday night, Saturday thing. So lots of different options. And I know Lisette had mentioned in the forums when I was writing about synchronous that you know sometimes it is hard. Uh, as long as people know up front, and you know, there's no way I could teach. Um, learning through literature with young adults if they didn't have, a, my students didn't have a chance to get together and talk about literature and meet in book clubs. And I could model and demonstrate for them. So the synchronous is very important in my class. Any comments about synchronous and any difficulty? <laughs> any difficulties or questions about doing that? Well, like I said, opportunities, this may be something um, you could share. Oppor time zones are a real challenge. Oh, my goodness. And that's why I think MOOCs have really set a good example with recording every session. Um, and you know, it might be wise, Sylvia, to actually vary the times. That would be raise havoc on a catalog, in the catalog, but to vary the times so you can have people um, at different times uh, available to meet together. Um, so, it, it, there, you know, we are geographically, um, chronologically bound sometimes, too. But when you can get together, and I build this in. Oh, what time is it for, for me? It's, um, it's 11.35 here. Ooh, it's going fast. Okay. So what I have, uh, I, try, and I know there are lots of difficulties, but when possible, to add that synchronous component 
if appropriate, if you need that in a class, I think it's very appropriate. Um, different ways you can do synchronous, of course, you can do Blackboard Collaborate. Um, Second Life is, uh, that's where I spend most of my time in class. I love teaching in Second Life. It just seems very unreal to see myself and not my avatar on the screen. And um, also I've been using, when I have a very small class, um, I've been using Google Hangout. And the beauty of that is that you can tape it, you can stream it live, archive it, and so it's ready for those students who perhaps uh, are different time zones. I don't have that problem yet. Again, I don't have a large MOOC with a, a global presence, but um, it's available for students who um, miss the class too. So lots of opportunities to do the synchronous. Flipping. Now, Tony Bates mentioned flipping, and everybody's heard about flipping as a hybrid model. I'm curious, what do you know about flipping? Let me quickly, what do you know about flipping? And I have developed, you'll see the link there, um, a wiki with uh, lots of information about uh, hybrid models and flipping, and um, yeah, it, it's the big thing now. Yes, the big thing should be spending class time on interaction. But I am finding that a lot of times, like I was in my book field, uh, Brookfield book club the other day on critical thinking, and when I mentioned flipping, everybody said, oh, that's where you make videos, so you put your lectures and videos and show those ahead of class. And that's not the whole idea. It should be learner-centered. Um, You'll find in the wiki some articles, uh, one by a, a Canadian teacher I really respect, she, um, Shelley Wright, who writes about how she was really into flipping and then discovered that it wasn't as learner-centered as, as she had hoped it would be. And a couple of science teachers, too, um, there's a great article by Schwartz where um, they talk about um, that all the, all the focus seems to be on the videos and not on the, the real live interactive stuff. And that's what it needs to be. Okay. And there are, oh, and I've got to mention too, Derek Mueller, and that's M U, and you'll get the link. Thank you, Ajax. Uh, has done some research for his dissertation on how do you make really great videos? And uh, despite the popularity of the Khan videos, Khan Academy, they're not always the greatest for actually um, encouraging students to examine their assumptions, especially about science. Students come with, I know I come with lots of assumptions. And the first thing you want to do is help them, Brookfield would be proud, to critically examine their assumptions. And when you do that, then the video and, and the content can really sink in when you lead them to question. So um, a lot now about flipping, about how to really make videos that flip well, and but mostly on how do you create these opportunities for students to think about the learning and the topics that get involved with inquiry ahead of time. Okay. And again, I've developed a wiki, and you can check this out, and it's pretty much the model I look at is a creative um, interactive model. I call it collaborative critical inquiries after the work of Cummings and Sayers, Brave New School, written years ago. Um, but it's the idea of pursuing inquiry-based, one of the elements of first steps, and getting students involved um, with the topic ahead of time. So we do this before class, and you'll see that there is both a before class with um, engaging with the question, reflecting on what you know, reviewing resources that I share and some they share. Uh, you compose and publish a response. You can compose and publish a response and use different um, tools, everything from forums to blogging. My students have blogs. Two, using a tool called VoiceThread. How many of you have you used VoiceThread before? I love using VoiceThread because it's so good. It's an introductory activity. You hear people's voices. There you go. Thanks, Ajax. And because I love, yeah, I love it, Sylvia. Um, I love it because I can do this collaborative critical inquiry, like I, you see an example here, on theories. 
what about MAT students who are coming fresh from their BA degrees know about teaching theories of literacy, literature, and learning? And so in reading their funds of knowledge, um, uh, recognizing Louis Malle's work in Funds of Knowledge, in reading the Funds of Knowledge blog post, I learned, oh, you know, are they musicians? They would probably enjoy researching gardeners, multiple intelligences. I matched them up with theories. They research and they create a um, voice thread um, comment, and then they listen to each other. You know, you probably could, Elizabeth. I haven't used Wimbo voice tools. Um, what I, what I like about VoiceThread is there's the visual and you see the, fa the icons, the faces around, and it's all in one place. I would definitely recommend checking that out. You can do like three for free. Um, sorry, that is, this happens before we meet, before, this is asynchronous. Uh, they engage with their peers, again, they read, they comment, and then, uh, and sort of pull it all together and bring that to class where then we participate in a live seminar. And then afterwards they critically reflect in their blog posts for the week. And I, I know there are variations on this. Eileen had one with the, um, for her micro teaching about the, um, I think it was the active uh, response uh, reading assignment. So lots of variations, but the idea of focusing on what happens before uh, they come to class to prepare them and then create an opportunity to dig deeper um, think on higher levels, um, the emergent learning. I think it gives an opportunity for the creativity of emergent learning there. Any questions about the collaborative critical inquiry? Again, lots of opportunities and on the wiki that I've shared, uh, you can learn more about it. And try out a voice thread. Okay. Learning environment is the next classification in Clara's system. Mark whether you are, use a learning management system or social media. There could be combinations of both here, I'm sure. And again, there's no right or wrong. It's sort of like the term organic in gardening. You can't be 100% organic and perhaps would not want to be, but um, uh, depending on the context and the teaching. All right, so lots of, um, lots of variations here. And um, that's good to see. Let me move quickly to um, the very last classification, and that's network. And this is perhaps the most interesting one to me. And it's looking at your class as centralized with the teacher as the hub, and all the assignments are the same, all the activities are the same, sameness. Decentralized means there's group work, there's opportunity for choices. Um, there are multiple ways. Um, to learn in this course. Distributed, you know, there is not one way ever in distributed. I could give DS, Digital Storytelling 106, as a, a MOOC is distributed learning, exactly. Um, my class is more decentralized with the projects and the group work, and I, you know, I, I would, I would, I'm moving that way toward distributed, I would hope to. And again, uh, Lisa Lane uh, in this upcoming book by Claire Majors is, is, does a great case study on a centralized class. So lots of opportunities depending on your course and your students. Yeah, the Moodle as an anchor um, I think is, is, a, is a really good option and, and I'm seeing that in a lot of, um, in a lot of MOOCs. Speaking of MOOCs. Joshua Kim has said in his article, How a MOOC Can Be a Faculty's Best Friend, that MOOCs give us the opportunity to experience, just like you mentioned, the MOOC can be you know, a really great anchor for, for a MOOC you might be planning or for a course you're planning, but to experience these MOOC experiments and then we can layer that on the most important layers. Um, which are interactions between faculty and students um, and the personal relationships that we build between educators and learners. And I think that's very exciting. And I know that's what influenced my opening up my class in exploring hybrid learning, uh, was experiencing my first MOOC. 
So I think that may be the greatest contribution that MOOCs have in helping us to develop open academic practice and work toward hybrid learning. Big wind up here. Um, so I know that, oh, you can, can you hardly see how much my tomato weighed? Um, you can achieve personal success and satisfaction in gardening online and offline. Uh, like a 1.55 uh, tomato, pound tomato there. Um, my community garden, you can see a big, oh, yeah, it was pounds. I'm sorry. I should do metric. Um, you can see a big, um, oh, that's probably 40 pounds of greens right there that we contribute to the plant a row for the hungry, to feed the hungry in our area from our community garden. I'm very proud of that. We've also seeded over 70 gardens uh, around the world, latest in Frankfurt, Germany, from our community garden. You also get a chance to influence, encourage, inspire, teach future gardeners. And here are some of my favorites from our community garden. But I think that, yeah, it is teamwork. Again, you know, the, the lone gardener I enjoy, I so enjoy the participatory gardening, too, in, with the community garden. Um, oh, and um, we can add our blog, too, so you can uh, check out our community garden. We're very proud of <sighs> Peas on Earth. I love the quote by Carl Rogers that we would, by our own openness, tend to bring forth openness and realism on the part of others. And Scott and Hugo were, uh, were having a conversation recently in a forum. And Scott said, we really don't have to be the same to be together. And I think it's a myth that globalization's main value is a kind of harmony built of one perfect agreement. And Hugo, and that's so true, it's no panacea. And Hugo replied, I dare to think, certainly say, that the time of really public and democratic education has come. So I'm very inspired by the MOOC movement and opportunities like First Step to um, layer on that foundation of relationships and uh, create a community of practice we, where we explore together um, how we can best teach in higher ed. And uh, looking back at our original creative collage from Jenny's session, uh, even then we had the mortar board. And good luck, everyone. I know I've certainly enjoyed and, and, <laughs> and learned so much uh, from everyone in the forums and the blogs. And um, I, um, you know, it's just a great opportunity to create this community of practice uh, and one that I'm very happy to have. And I would encourage you to add to our yearbook collage, OK? So any sort of reflections, any sort of uh, comments or accolades for um, the group, anything you'd like to add to our yearbook collage, please think about it. It gets a star. And uh, I'll give you just a second to do this, and then I'll do the, um, my last slide for you. So this is sort of our yearbook. Do you guys, is a yearbook like a? Um, or annual? Is that like an international thing? I was going to play pop and circumstance, but it didn't communicate too well. Um, it just got static. So, dum dum da dum 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 da 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 da. <laughs> Don't know if that's very universal either. It is here for graduation marches. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I know the beauty of it. Uh, Scott says there is an afterlife because I know that. Um, I will be following many of you to see how your MOOCs may be participating in your MOOCs. Ah, I love the wooden clogs. That could be Healy. <laughs> Heart and soul and brain food at once. And in that order, beyond the small confines of the classroom. This is cool. We'll probably see a lot of you as we grow old globally in the MOOC that just started this week. It is nice to have um, such a community of practice where people are so passionate about teaching, not just online teaching, but teaching, uh, and teaching in higher ed specifically to come back to. You. Oh, a duchy abroad, OK. 
Any questions, comments? Um, as we finish up our yearbook. Chris, can I take this opportunity just to say, wow, that was really, I love the way that you drew so many threads together for that and uh, how, how inspirational and creative the, the discussion has been. Uh, really, I'm looking for, looking for the hand popping symbols now. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. That's, that's, <laughs> but that's another one of those Java things that seems to have gone, gone wonky on the machine. But really well done. That's uh, said, said what I was hoping you might say, I guess. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what I was hoping? But I think that that was uh, really, really that's a great experience. Fun and learning in one place. I remember a long time ago, I was uh, doing educational development, software development, and we were bidding for a job with somebody, and we were helping them to write a spec to put out a tender. And I wanted them to put into it that the learning, that the, the application had to be fun. And everybody just like kind of looked at me around one of those sort of blank faces. The, the concept that learning technology could be fun is just you know, completely alien. But I really tried to hold on to that as one of the, one of the operating principles that I bring to my teaching and my work in general. And say that it always works, but gosh, you got to try. It's not fun. <laughs> what are you doing it for? I love the, the hands out. I like that. <laughs> and the victory sign. Very cool. Victory gardens. Online, offline. Thank you guys for adding Please to the yearbook. Let me just show you my. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it. I just wanted to show you the last slide. Again, all of the resources. Thank you, thank you, my loyal link dropper, Bill. I think you've got most of them in there for sure. And um, any that I see in the back channel, I'll go back and add to. Uh, and they uh, are listed or will be at um, all of them soon at the Digo um, Open Opportunities. Okay? So thank you, everyone, um, for the opportunity to um, lead the conversation. Let's check that. Can I ask you to paste that Digo link? It probably is in several different places, but if you can get it over into the Moodle as well as in here, that would be great. Yeah, let me give you that. Yeah, link dropper, new role. <laughs> I like the link dropper. That's right. Every every uh, speaker needs a link dropper. Yeah. And uh, Liz and Sylvia will get this, uh, this recording will be up um, in, the, in the not too distant future. Um, can I just encourage everybody that's in this session who hasn't yet done it to um, contribute to the asynchronous online um, conference virtual exhibition. That would be great. You don't have to do a peer review session if you don't want, but we'd love to see a few slides that capture something about your teaching practice. It could be something that has gone on in the past, or it could be something that you've just learned in the last few weeks, but we'd love to see some contributions to the online conference that uh, I suppose closes the asynchronous um, aspect of this, of this, of this module. So get your posters in now. <laughs> That's the teacher talking. Yeah, I really like uh, the virtual conference um, too. I, I, that's a great addition. Yeah, we've got a lot of thinking to do about how we uh, um, do this. This is sort of the first. You know, the course has been uh, been validated, and it gets integrated into the program from next year. And so it's sort of, you know, we're somewhere halfway between pilot and full blown, um, full blown course. I'm really pleased that Oxford Brooks uh, decided that they would let us accredit the MOOC, even though they're torturing me by making me revalidate the whole program. But I think it's a small price to pay to get uh, open, open learning, open online learning recognized within mainstream academic development work. So Chris, thank you very much. Uh, I'm in Bournemouth. I've got to get a taxi to a train station to get back to Oxford, which 
be a couple of hours from now. So um, without further ado, can I thank you, thank uh, Marion, Liz, Sylvia, yes, Sylvia is still in the room, and all the participants, everybody who's been uh, an expert participant support, and everybody, by now you're all expert participants, and we'll be approached to join the course again next year. So uh, looking forward to seeing you um, in the next couple of days. Um, badges are being a uh, bit of a trial and a tribulation, but I think we've got them sorted for most people now. Um, and away we go. So um, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much.